Welcome back. In the last lecture, I defined what Byzantine history is and framed a general outline in order to understand it. This time we're going to start with the Emperor Diocletian, his rise to power, and find out why he was so unique and important to Byzantine history. All was not well with the Roman Empire. The second century had witnessed both the apogee of Roman power and the start of that long decline which would bring the West to its knees. The problem, quite simply, was one of succession. Augustus Caesar, for all his brilliance, had never managed to solve this most important imperial question. A question, by the way, that remains unsolved for large parts of the modern world. A quick glance at Latin American history, for example, will demonstrate how turbulent succession can be, and how fortunate we in America are to live in a state where every four to eight years a peaceful transfer of power occurs. The best solution Rome came up with was during the reigns of the so-called Five Good Emperors, they're sometimes called the adoptive emperors because of their unique solution to the imperial question. Adopt a successor who will share your job in your lifetime, and they'll be up to speed, so to speak, when they assume power at your death. This system worked brilliantly until the last of the good emperors, the so-called philosopher emperor Marcus Aurelius, died in 180, leaving the empire not to a trained successor, but to his aptly named son, Commodus. Alone of the adoptive emperors, Marcus Aurelius had the fortune and misfortune to have a son, and for all his stoic philosophy, he could not entrust the empire to a stranger and leave his son disinherited. It's an understandable sentiment, but Rome would pay dearly for it. Commodus was a colorful, if insane, emperor who genuinely thought that he was a reincarnated Hercules, and spent many hours fighting gladiators and shooting animals in the Colosseum to demonstrate it. He claimed to have killed over 12,000 men in the arena, in an age when most Romans considered gladiators to be the bottom rung of society. He renamed Rome Colonia Commodiana in honor of himself, and replaced all the months of the calendar with 12 of his names. Not surprisingly, he managed to make himself so unpopular during his 12-year reign that he got himself assassinated. And this was the start of a steady decline in both power and prestige, reaching a chaotic low point in the 3rd century. The army increasingly chose the emperors, most of whose reigns were short and who met violent deaths, often at the hands of their own troops. The army had discovered the dangerous secret of empire, that they had the key to build emperors, or tear them down. The Praetorian Guard, ironically enough started by Augustus to protect the emperor, often had an important role in this king-making and king-breaking and the success of a candidate many times was determined by how effectively he could buy them off. In 193, the guard even auctioned off the office of emperor to the highest bidder, and then killed the lucky winner 66 days later when he couldn't live up to his promises. But the 50 years between 235 and 285 are often seen as the low point, with a succession of forgettable rulers marching across the Roman stage at an average of one every two years. In 238, for example, there were five legitimate emperors, and the Historia Augusta mentions 20 pretenders. To put this in perspective, consider that in the United States, if you're 50 years old, then you've lived through an average of eight presidents. A 50-year-old in 285 would have known 27 legitimate emperors, numerous pretenders, and at least one breakaway empire. This brings us to the year 283. The emperor of the moment was named Carus. He had been head of the Praetorian Guard and had taken advantage of his predecessor's absence in the east to seize the throne. Carus had two sons, Carinus, a bit of a playboy but a good general, and Numerian, a decent poet but not much else. The other two important figures of the day were both commoners, Lucius Flavius Aper and Gaius Valerius Diocles. Aper, whose fancy name in Latin means wild pig, was an extremely ambitious man who had insinuated himself into the imperial family by marrying off his daughter to Carus's younger son, Numerian. He had then risen to become Praetorian commander, one of the most powerful positions in the empire. Knowing that he would not likely become emperor himself, his goal was to put a son on the throne. His main civilian rival in this was Diocles, whose slightly more august name means Zeus's glory. The son of a freedman and a scribe, Diocles received a classical education was fluent in both Latin and Greek, and was a voracious reader. As a young man, he entered the army and quickly rose through the ranks to become commander of the imperial bodyguard. He seems to have had visions of grandeur early on, and a seer is said to have prophesied that he would become emperor one day by killing a boar. 
In 283, Carus decided to go east on one of the Roman Empire's chronic wars with Persia. Taking Aper and Diocles and his son Numerian with him, he, perhaps due to the tenor of the times, appointed Carinus to be Augustus of the West in his absence, ensuring a smooth transfer of power in case anything should happen to him. The campaign was a success with the Romans sacking the Persian capital, but the army got no further because there, on the banks of the Tigris, the 59-year-old Carus was killed by a bolt of lightning, which is probably just a sly way of saying that Diocles assassinated him. Numerian was now, by default, in charge of the expedition. Unfortunately for him, he had contracted a serious eye infection during the campaign, and not wanting the soldiers to see him in such a condition, was forced to travel in a closed litter. And this gave someone, probably Diocles, the perfect opportunity to strike. With the capture of the Persian capital, the campaign had come to a successful conclusion, and Numerian had ordered the army to withdraw. Each day his closed carriage would take its place in the ranks as the troops wound their way across Asia Minor. By the time they reached Nicomedia, however, they noticed a horrendous smell coming from the carriage. They broke open the doors and found the partially decomposed body of Numerian. Diocles seized the opportunity and immediately accused Aper of the crime, hauled him in front of the army, declared a death sentence without allowing Aper to speak, and personally carried out the execution right there before the entire army. Not surprisingly, the troops hailed him as emperor, and having slain the boar, he Latinized his name to Diocletian. His struggle, however, was only half over. There was still the matter of Carinus in the West. I always feel a bit sorry for Carinus. His father and brother have both been assassinated, probably by the same man who is now marching at the head of an army to kill him. And on top of that, the Germans and the British both rise in revolt, and Italy itself supports a pretender named Julianus. His reign was descending into chaos. But whatever his flaws, Carinus was a good general. He crushed the revolts easily, and in the beginning of 285 he defeated the Italian pretender Julianus. This left him free to deal with the bigger threat of Diocletian. The two armies met by the river Margus, near modern-day Belgrade. Carinus was the better general, and had the larger army, and the tide soon turned against Diocletian. On the verge of victory, however, Carinus's past caught up with him. One of his officers, whose wife he had seduced, struck him down, pulling defeat out of the jaws of victory. Carinus's troops went over to Diocletian without opposition, and he stood as the undisputed master of the Roman world. The first thing that set Diocletian apart from his contemporaries was that there was no bloodbath upon his accession to complete power. In what would be the first twist in a reign full of them, he pardoned most of his political opponents and found positions in his administration for some of them. Solutions like these would be both brilliant and unorthodox and would continue to astound his subjects. He had four main problems to overcome. The first was that there was a chronic shortage of troops to fight all the empire's wars. The second was that there wasn't enough money to pay the troops they did have. This was a major problem because underpaid troops tend to get uppity and lead to the third problem, chronic civil war. Or to put it another way, his third problem was how to decrease the power of overmighty generals. The fourth and final problem was the one of succession. If he could solve all the other issues, how could he ensure that his death did not result in more civil wars? The solution to the first problem was simple. He had to increase the number of men in the army, so he made the army a more attractive place to be. Serve in the legions, and you could retire to your own plot of land, perhaps with quite a bit of money stored up. Or you could use the army to launch a political career and end up a prefect, or even in charge of an entire province. Reforms were enacted which made the advancement based on merit instead of family connection. The problem of money was a bit more difficult as no one in the ancient world had a firm grasp of economics. The treasury was a bit short of money, so he minted more, not realizing that this was devaluing the currency and fueling inflation. He was a bit more successful, however, in reforming the tax system. Previously there was a uniform tax. Everybody paid the same amount. Massive corruption aside, the main problem with this system was that if you set the rate so that you get enough money, there's no way the poor can pay it. And if you set the rate so the poor can pay it, then you don't get enough money to run your government. His solution was deceptively simple, a per capita system, or a scaled rate depending on how much money you made. The rich pay more, and the poor pay less. 
He then set up a census every five years to find out who qualified for each rate. This worked extremely well, and with the increased efficiency, the average tax that people paid had actually went down. Unless, of course, you lived in Rome, there you didn't have to pay taxes at all. The next problem was how to prevent civil wars. Having just killed off all the legitimate emperors himself, he had to make sure that it would never happen again. Given the recent history of the empire, Diocletian's main initial concern was how to elevate the status of emperor. To restore respect for the office, he introduced as much pomp and circumstance into his public appearances as possible. He began to emphasize that the imperial government was not in a city, Rome, but wherever the emperor was. And this is a first step in the process of founding a new capital of the Roman Empire. But his most ingenious plan involved the gods. It had long been the practice of emperors to deify their predecessors. Diocletian just took it one step further and announced that he was the son of Jupiter. Every citizen of the empire was not only bound to obey him, but to sacrifice to him as well. And it added increased security as assassination was now sacrilege. Of course, this policy also brought him into sharp conflict with a significant minority of the population who refused to worship him, and so began the last great persecution of the Christians. As further insurance against revolt, Diocletian restructured the army. He had provided a blueprint for anyone who cared to look about how to become emperor, and to prevent this from happening again, he had to take as much power away from his generals as possible. To do this, he created two kinds of armies, one on the frontier, where there were permanent frontier troops, and one with the emperor, which was vastly superior, called the field army. If any frontier was in danger of being overrun, the emperor would simply arrive with his field army and drive them back. This ensured that the most capable force in the empire was personally loyal to the emperor and not a general. And in another long overdue move, he established the Praetorian Guard. Diocletian could now turn to the problem of succession, and it was here that he showed his most surprising innovation. One of his first actions as, as emperor was to adopt his drinking buddy Maximian to help him run the empire. Now that probably sounds a bit strange to modern ears. To adopt a grown man, especially one who's barely five years younger than you, and one of your best friends to boot, but it was a standard practice in the Roman Empire as a way to share your power with a colleague. In other words, he was officially announcing that he considered Maximian as a successor, or at least as someone who would take care of things in the West while he was busy in the East. At first he elevated him to Caesar, or junior emperor, and sent him off to Britain and Gaul to deal with a revolt there. Maximian succeeded in crushing the Gaulish revolt, but was unable to cross the channel and deal with the British due to the nascent British fleet. Diocletian recognized the seriousness of the revolt, and to strengthen Maximian's hand, he elevated him to the rank of Augustus, or senior emperor. This is an extraordinary development in the history of the West. For the first time, an empire is splitting in half, peacefully. For the first time, there were two legitimate emperors, and this could very easily have resulted in yet another power struggle. But Diocletian had chosen well. Maximian was honest and hardworking, but most importantly, he was willing to take second place to Diocletian. They may have both been emperors, but there was no doubt who was supreme. Diocletian had them both associated with gods, but took Jupiter, the senior god, as his patron, while Maximian took the junior Hercules. This clearly demonstrated that Diocletian was the senior partner, and he maintained the power of veto for all policy decisions. In practice, Maximian deferred to his partner, but each emperor had their own court, their own army, and a separate administration. The empire remained juridically one and was on occasion ruled by one emperor, but after 285 it had different prefects and administrations and can be seen as east and west. Before Diocletian it was common to adopt a Caesar and occasionally the empire was split by rebellion or emergency, but these were only temporary arrangements. Diocletian probably didn't initially intend for this split to be permanent either, but by 290 two things had become clear. One, that he has had his hands full with the East, and secondly, that the joint rulership worked remarkably well. In an age of constant revolt and invasion, the empire was simply too big to be ruled by one man, so Diocletian made it clear that Maximian was a colleague, not an heir. To cement this new permanent split of the empire, 
Diocletian and Maximian adopted their son-in-laws, Galerius and Constantius Chlorus, and raised them to the rank of Caesar, junior emperor. This system is sometimes called the Tetrarchy, or Four Rulers, though that name is a bit misleading, as there were two senior emperors, Augusti, and two junior ones, Caesari. Next time you're at St. Mark's Basilica in Venice, look for the beautiful porphyry sculpture in the southeast corner of the exterior. It's carved to re represent these four emperors. It was stolen from Constantinople during the Fourth Crusade and incorporated into the masonry of the church. Diocletian's most surprising decision, however, was still to come. In 304, preparations began for the celebration of Diocletian's 20th year in power. He went to Rome for the first time in his entire reign to unveil his baths and fell deathly ill. He traveled to Ravenna to get away from the marshy climate, but on the way collapsed. Against all expectations, he didn't die. Nearing 60, he had begun to feel the weight and cares of the empire, and so he made a stunning decision. He retired. This, then, became Diocletian's solution to the problem of succession. It is, in a way, going back to the days of the five good emperors. You pick your successors during your lifetime, retire, ensuring a smooth transfer of power, and they in turn pick their own successors to train. There are, however, several problems. For instance, there are no term limits, so what if an emperor doesn't want to step down? And the successors will be at each other's throats within two years, but Diocletian's reforms will lay the foundations of government for the next thousand years. Having come up with this solution, then, the only way to make it permanent was to talk Maximian into retiring as well, setting a precedent. The only problem was Maximian was extremely unwilling to do this, but he demonstrated his loyalty and dutifully stepped down with his friend on May 1st, 305. Their two Caesars were elevated to Augusti and appointed Caesars of their own, restarting the cycle. Diocletian himself decided to spend his retirement planting cabbages. Though certainly not your average cabbage farmer, he lived in a palace so large it later became a city, the modern city of Split in Croatia, and his octagonal mausoleum is still the heart of the city. He reappears only once in 308. The empire has fallen into chaos, and the emperors have come to Diocletian to beg him to resume imperial power. His response to them gently, yet firmly, insists that he is enjoying retirement. If you could see the cabbages that I have planted at Salona with my own hands, you would never again judge the empire to be a tempting prospect. He died three years later in 311, a contented yet disillusioned man. His daughter and wife had been exiled by one of his successors, his statues had been torn down, and his prestige had all but disappeared. And yet it was his abdication that most awed his contemporaries. As one of them wrote, Diocletian showed exceptional character inasmuch as he alone of all emperors since the establishment of the Roman Empire, retired of his own accord from such an eminent position to private life and ordinary citizenship. He experienced, therefore, what no one else has since the creation of man, namely, that although he died as a private citizen, he was nevertheless enrolled among the gods. When Diocletian assumed power, it appeared as if he was just another barracks emperor, he came to power through blood and intrigue, and having no sons, there was little hope of a dynasty. Most likely his contemporaries thought that he would just continue the cycle of a civil war that had been ripping apart the empire. And yet, Diocletian's reign would instead bring an unprecedented stability. He would reform the empire and reign for over twenty years, longer than any other emperor in a century and a half. His political revolution collapsed within his lifetime, and yet his administrative and military reforms did the impossible. They effectively stopped the cycle of civil war and would endure in the East for more than a thousand years to come. Next time we'll talk about the coming of Constantine, an ignored son who would one day rise to reunite the empire and become the only